Yeah. Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to this morning's session. The session has been organized uh, and managed by Louise Ravelli. So you've all met her already, but I'll, I'll do my standard presentation as I didn't do it on Tuesday uh, because I didn't want to steal uh, time from your organizational work. I'll just say a few words so that you, you can start getting ready. Louise Ravelli is professor at the School of Arts and Media at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. Her research expertise includes multimodal communication, museum communication, discourse analysis, systemic functional grammar, using the framework of systemic functional linguistics, social semiotics, and multimodal discourse analysis. She has authored a number of books, starting from, or starting it takes to pick some, but certainly most relevant today, Museum Text, Communication Framework from 2006, and more recently, uh, uh, Multimodality in the Built Environment, Spatial Discourse Analysis. But she's also worked on a number of other um, fields, including, for example, Academic Discourse, where I had more than one opportunity to appreciate her work, but certainly, um, especially for the topic we have today, we identify her with museum communication. She has also worked as communication consultant for uh, museums, like the Australian Museum or the Museum of Contemporary Art Australia, um, and also provided guidelines. So it, it, her skill in moving between the theory and the practice of museum communication that I find particularly uh, fascinating and interesting in her work. She's also editor of the Journal of Visual Communication and she's also uh, a very generous academic who's given, I think, a, a highly interesting contributions in general and to our own work. Um, today is managing this session that you will all be contributing to on using spatial discourse analysis, museums and other things in the 21st century. Thank you very much. The floor is yours and to your organization. Thank you, Marina, that's very generous. Um, lovely, hello again, everyone. Um, uh, thank you for all the submissions you've put on the Google Drive. Really enjoyed looking at your work. I've made some, minor annotations here and there, nothing systematic, but little points. And so at the end of the session today, I'll come back to some general points for everyone about applying the spatial discourse analysis. But um, hopefully you've been able to communicate a little bit with each other in your groups. So what I wanted to do first is talk about um, uh, your response to the question for your group and um, have a short discussion of that, but we only want about five minutes per group, and then some time at the end for um, picking up general points and so on, okay? So um, if we can start with uh, group one, which was Anna Sophia, Delfina, Daniel, um, and Daniel P. I hope um, one of you was chosen as the spokesperson who was chosen for that group or self-selected perhaps. No, I was chosen. Delfina. Okay, so your group um, was looking at a number of buildings, um, the Museum of Art in Sao Paulo, Brazil, the Tercentenary Theatre in Harvard Yard, an, an art installation there, the shop Bute Gamata, um, from Daniel in Casal Grande and the Aros Art Museum in Aarhus, Denmark. Okay, so um, Delfina, um, if, and your, the question for your group was particularly, how is immersion achieved in these spaces? Um, so we, we all filled out our worksheets and then we shared them with each other. So we all read each other's work and we discussed for a bit and we realized that the first thing, one of the first things that came up was that all of these that are quite different actually shared a very material reality with the glass. 
Um, and it was very interesting to talk about how glass had an effect on the immersive experience, specifically by um, kind of playing with the continuity of what is the interior and what is the exterior and the idea of transparency. So being able to look, to look at things from a within and from outside perspective. Um, and then this was also connected to our discussion about margins and boundaries in a way. And we thought that it was very interesting that um, we thought that in, in the different uh, spatial texts, there was a, a dematerialization of these margins where they weren't very clear where, where things ended and when they started. Uh, even when there were solid margins, they seemed to be integrated and had been thought uh, very much explicitly. Um, and specifically for, for very much creating a sense of immersion for humans in those spaces, we also recognized that there was um, a, a taking advantage of size, of the concept of size and of the experience of size. Um, for example, in the one of the art museums, there was this very big sculpture of a human. So there is a sense of immersion. We, we thought that there is a sense of immersion from recognizing one's, one's own size compared to someone, someone or a sculpture that is much bigger. In the art installation, there was the size of the surrounding buildings uh, and the sense of overshadowing. Uh, so we thought that was one thing. And then the the last uh, big thing that we discussed was that they all kind of had an invitation and more of an interactive component, an invitation to move around either by being circular shapes or with this um, big sculpture that we were talking about, uh, being able to be looked at from different angles in the Sao Paulo Art Museum also the, the, the ability of people to be able to walk around. And uh, I think that's it. There was a lot of playfulness with what is inside and what is outside, which we thought that um, was very playful, including with, with something like a shop, which, we, which was very interesting to compare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, uh, that's a really fantastic answer. I remember Daniel's shop was quite different from the others, but um, Daniel, you were speaking about the windows and the flooring creating some continuity with the outside. Yeah. And it had a fairly large scale relative to the other shops around it. So not quite the scale of the art institution or the Harvard buildings, but nevertheless, a relative sense of scale, perhaps. Yes, that's very interesting. So you picked up there that uh, one material resource can have an impact across different metafunctions. So here the glass is, is playing with the sense of boundary, um, which relates to organizational meaning, so framing and... Um, uh, the creation of information values and so on, but it also impacts interactional meaning, like where the user can be positioned or senses themselves being positioned. Um, perhaps also representational, not so sure about that. Yeah, but as you say, very much immersion through a whole variety of resources, the glass, the scale, and um, uh, picking up different metafunctional meanings, you know, being inside, outside, and so on. Yeah, yeah, very, very interesting. That lack of solidity. So in the Sao Paulo Art Museum, where the, many of the artworks are almost suspended, rather than being placed on the wall, they're suspended in the middle of the space. And the Harvard Yard, where you can walk around those glass sculptures with the papers on them. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Okay, just got like a minute if anyone else, uh, students from the other groups wants to jump in and ask a quick question of the group. Now's your chance. Just turn on your mic. Daniel, yes. Actually, uh, I'm from the group. So can I ask a question to you? Um, the question is, um, would it make sense from a methodological point of view when, when discussing immersion, 
and uh, you know with uh, buildings such as ours where glass actually uh, makes it I mean it creates a barrier between the interior and the exterior but at the same time it's invisible when it's a transparent one um, would it make sense to reason on how um, it's not only the immersion of the person within the space but it's a, or, or the text but it's also the immersion of the text within the social context and how the person is made to be immersed both in the text and in what it, it is around because to me personally the presence of so much glass is like an invitation for the person who is within the, the, the text to also feel as part of the rest of the text of, of the rest to this social um, situation, whatever it is. And so there is like a sort of trans immersion because you are immersed in one specific test, but at the same time, you also have an experience of what is outside the, the text in a different way because you are within this, the text. Yes, but at the same yeah, I think that's time, yeah. If you're in, so, yeah, that's the question. It's like, because I was thinking, like, like if you are in, in, inside such a place and outside there's like a storm or something, you're still experiencing the thing, but you can so, sort of perfectly see it from within a uh, space where the storm, storm is not happening. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Maybe I think it was that's, a bit of a mess. No, 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 I think that's a very good point and that um, points to knowing um, where your analysis sits in the rank scale. So is it the user in relation to the building or perhaps the building in relation to its own context, for example? So that sense um, immersion, which is just sort of almost a term I plucked from the air, but it was just something that seemed to me common in those texts. Um, it can be achieved in different ways and at different ranks. Yep, absolutely. Also in terms of the glass being uh, solid, so it is a barrier, but uh, visually it's transparent. So when you get into the details of framing, what kind of framing, there's further delicacy in the systems in terms of whether there's permeability um, physically, orally, um, sensorily, et cetera, um, which comes from the work of um, Boris and Norgard in um, Southern Denmark University. Yeah, so there's always more detail you can add. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Daniel. All right, so um, group two, um, Federico, Arundi, Chiara and Elena, who were looking at the Chelsea Football Club Museum, the Wellington Cable Car Museum, the Aquarium of Genoa and the, Lap the Lapidary Museum. I um, forget where that one was. So who's gonna speak for that group? Group two. Yeah, we're actually, you know, uh, rules are like records, so we, we split it up. I'll just you, give you a quick overview of the meaning and, you know, the institution or, or the objects that are construed in those texts and then leave the floor to Arandi to pick up, you know, the spatial analysis of, uh, of how yeah. this is actually uh, achieved. Can I, uh, can I just interrupt? So for everyone, so, that, so I forgot to say the question for the group is how is the entity, either the object or the institution construed in, in these spaces. Yeah, sorry, go on. Fairly yeah, so we start, we have an aquarium and, you know, it picks up from, from where we left off, uh, talking about immersion, because it gives you an idea of, you know, the metaphor of diving into the ocean and, you know, experience uh, sea life, sea animals and creatures uh, in an immersive way. Uh, we had a uh, lapidary museum, so, you know, in line with Hugo Foscolo's idea of, you know, the importance of uh, remembering those who came before us full of tombstones and their location that celebrate the Roman past of uh, Modena and, you know, important people who uh, belong to the city. Uh, for, for Chelsea Museum, it's a private institution located inside the team zone stadium. So it's, you know, a way of the institution self-promoting itself, uh, showcasing memorabilia, paraphernalia and trophies that, you know, celebrate the historic past of the team and, you know, the pride of being a Chelsea supporter and a member of that team. And we, you know, we fly to New Zealand, the Wellington Cable Car Museum. So uh, it's a celebration of what is quaint, old fashioned and unique to the city of Wellington. Um, the, the Wellington Cable Car Experience, but also as a part of Wellington Museum, it's a celebration of New Zealand as a whole, its history, its heritage and its past. Uh, now I'll leave the floor to Arandi to say something about the space. Okay. okay. So, um, as Federico explained, so we've been given 
multiple locations for different um, locations. Now, if you first look at the aquarium, the Genu um, Genoa, um, you see um, a building that appears as a low concrete um, block, um, of which the irregular shape evokes um, that of a failing ship. So um, right from the very beginning, you feel that you're on a voyage. Um, and then once you enter the building, you see that it's all glass and um, you have a whole body of water um, that um, that you're surrounded with. So um, the space itself allows you to um, feel that you're immersed in a whole um, a journey through the sea, um, inside the sea, actually. So if I quickly uh, move um, on to the, um, the Museum La um, Lapidary, it's a very open space. Um, it's got um, two stones as the main objects of the exhibition. And um, at the center of the internal garden, there is a single statue. And it's possible to pass by the tombstones, admi um, admire them up close, and even touch them. And also that open space um, gives, in a way, it gives you a kind of um, space to wander around, feel the, uh, feel like you're part of nature, feel like you're, um, it, it looks like the tombstones make you feel like you are um, actually um, um, part of um, the Roman history and um, like the overall um, open space uh, evokes that sense of, um, that nostalgic sense of being inside um, a Roman particular culture. And um, if you look at the Chelsea Museum, it once again the um, it construes an image of the institution based on the prestigious history of the club and the pride of um, being part of um, Chelsea. The institution represents itself in a um, self-promotional way, and the um, vista is uh, offered with an immersion in one of the most important clubs in soccer history. And um, this is construed in space through a combination of meanings. The colors of the building replicate the team's official ones. Um, um, and also the first room has white um, rounded walls that resemble a soccer ball. And um, there's a, a trophy room where the lighting and uh, black walls make the cups look even more prestigious, um, emphasizing the brilliance, the preciousness and prestige of the awards. And also you have gaming rooms that are framed to increase interactivity and um, the space is organized in a way that puts emphasis on the most relevant parts of um, um, the, uh, basically the most prestigious parts of the exhibition. Um, and also, um, if you take a look at the Wellington Cable Car Museum, once again, um, it evokes a sense of what is quaint and also uh, it promotes New Zealand as a whole. So if you take a look, um, as you enter um, into the museum itself, um, it's like um, you enter through a rather narrow low entrance with, a low, with low lighting. So you get the feeling that you are walking through an underground tunnel just like um, the underground terminus uh, of the cable car at Lampenty. So um, the cape, and also um, once you enter actually, um, when you're inside, there is like a much bigger space um, with much brighter lighting to your um, right with a lot of tourist items, souvenirs of New Zealand that you can buy that are unique to New Zealand. Um, there are small stores occupying the entire right side of the room and uh, um, uh, also, it's interesting that you can only enter the second chamber after passing through the first chamber. There are two chambers. And um, the path leading you to the entrance of the second chamber takes you through all the gift items and the cable car is like, so because of that, um, while the cable car is a main participant of the museum, um, um, there are like um, actually, um, the, the items, the souvenirs are also like one big part of the museum as well. So both these things are evoked. So that's about it. Great, great. Thank you. Yes, so um, some quite different uh, spaces there, you know, talking or representing different things, you know, the aquarium, cable car, the football club, the um, 
lapidary museum, stone museum. Um, and, and what's interesting about that question is how, how have the uh, creators of those spaces created a sense of, of what the thing is, okay? And sometimes to answer that question, it can be quite hard. You could, the best way to answer it is to imagine how it could have been done differently, yeah? So the aquarium, I can easily imagine another not so interesting aquarium is just like a long row of tanks and you walk past them. But this one has created that sense of being uh, immersed again in the experience of being in the water with the fish. And it's done that through multiple um, design strategies. Um, the Stone Museum, we know it's connected to history and it's placed in an historical building, but it's quite different from an historical museum that recreates um, the original environment completely, yeah? So the tombstones have been taken from uh, graves or monuments and placed here to look at. So that's quite different. So another museum might reconstruct the original space. That gives the user quite a different understanding of what the object is. And it's interesting in the Chelsea Football Club, there's a few different options there. There's being in the football, you know, so like can't get more immersed than that. And there's looking at the trophies. Um, and then there's, you know, um, gathering particular bits of information about the sport and the history and so on. So it's the selection and placement of materials that or, or objects that create some of this as well as other aspects of the overall design, particularly the inclusion or exclusion of specific contextual factors. Yeah, yeah, very interesting, thank you. Um, quick opportunity if anyone um, from outside the group or a quick question from within the group, if you want to ask, now's your chance. Okay, all right, we'll move on then. So group three, uh, Nicola, Federico and Michael looking at Camp Nou, uh, the new Augustium uh, in the University of Leipzig and Museum Bolzano in Bozen, and also an art museum. And the question here is how does the nature of the building construe a particular set of values about the institution or its users? Okay, hello. Um, well, uh, Unfortunately, we couldn't manage to contact Michael, but we can leave the floor also to him as well. There's no problem at all. So I was chosen as a speak person. Uh, we, together with Nicola, we have chosen uh, two completely different uh, types of buildings. I've chosen um, one of the main buildings at University of Leipzig, where I have been in Erasmus, and Nicola has chosen a stadium. Well, uh, in, for answering to your suggested question for discussion, um, we realized together that different resources contained in both buildings, uh, so belonging to all meta functions, so combine together uh, to reproduce some of the values of these buildings or institutions. Institutions. So started from the University of Leipzig, um, there's this very, very uh, big uh, building, uh, although it is irregular in form, um, it suggests the greatness of this institution because of this very um, huge dimension uh, and also the fact that this institution is lasting for many centuries uh, starting from the um, from the date of foundation reported on the main door of the of the of, of the entrance building um, furthermore I realized because this was the building I cho I personally chose that the use of glass in the, in the external facade uh, suggests the uh, value and the ideal of transparency of the university and this is also characteristic for many 
German buildings, including offices of many enterprises. So uh, this was a, a striking thing which I uh, realized. And furthermore, uh, going in the interior of the building, the coexistence of different uh, resources such as stages inside, the, the presence of a church, the uh, welcome desk and the presence of computers uh, suggested the coexistence of many um, fields of knowledge, starting from art to uh, humanism and also technology. So again, it is a, like um, a, commish, a, commish, um, a fusion between a different fields of knowledge, starting from science and to human knowledge. Um, uh, furthermore, um, this, um, this uh, recall to technology and science is um, suggested by the uh, geometrical location of all the resources. So there's a precise order in the relocation of all the elements in the interior. Um, then the, uh, what I uh, realized was that one of the values suggested uh, by the institution in the interior of the Augustium was the, um, the, the, the sort of intercultural and in general the idea of exchange, which is suggested both by the presence of the um, help desk, which is uh, located immediately at the entrance of the building, and the freedom of movement you can have uh, um, going from one side of the, the building to the other buildings of the, the main campus. And this idea is also suggested by the many entrances in, in different parts of the city. This idea of campus in a city, which uh, still um, suggests this idea of continu ex continuous exchange and freedom to exchange and to get into the world of university, also without uh, exhibiting a uh, uh, university card. Um, as far as the Meske und Club Stadium, if I spell it correctly, Nicola, correct me if I make mistakes. Um, well, um, here, uh, what, uh, um, what, um, what, um, was uh, what struck um, Nicola uh, was the size uh, of the building. These uh, again, this a very huge building, which yes. was yeah, which was amplified uh, in the at the end of uh, the fifteen. Yes, perfect. And uh, yes, uh, okay, the, leave yeah, the floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just okay. a change, perfect. Uh, no, the the most interesting thing um, related to the values is the fact that um, with the, the Catalan identity, the strong Catalan identity finally uh, get into the stadium. And uh, I think that this is one of the most important uh, and interesting thing about the values that this stadium uh, inspire. Another important thing uh, is that um, in, in, in the... Yes? Sorry, Nicola. How, how do you think that Catalan identity gets into the stadium, how exactly? Yes, uh, first of all, for the, the, the written uh, on the tribunes, that uh, every, every, every week change, but uh, the, the normal one is Mesque un club, uh, more than a club. And uh, this is, uh, uh, it, it's, it's related with the, the idea of, it's not just a football team. It's a football team that uh, have lots of, um, interaction with uh, also the uh, cultural aspect of uh, the, the building. And another interesting thing, a geographical point of view, is the fact that uh, the other uh, football stadium in Barcelona, the Espanol football stadium, is uh, exactly uh, on the other part of the city. Like a really interesting uh, contrast between the two uh, identities. And then uh, one another important uh, idea I was uh, thinking about it that is um, these new buildings, uh, these new uh, types of uh, stadium uh, as a um, uh, from an historical point of view are changed all across uh, Europe um, in the sense that uh, the first stadium I was th I'm thinking to the English one was um, um, 
an open space where uh, the relationship among uh, players and, um, and fans and supporters uh, was different. Today we see uh, stadiums uh, um, as um, close, close in this sense because the relationship among uh, uh, and the social, the special, the, the special um, distance uh, among players and the supporters, it's uh, really, it's every time uh, big for uh, different okay. reasons. You're but just can... breaking up a little bit. Sorry? Sorry, my connection with Nicola is breaking up. Can everyone else hear me okay? Just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. Nope. No? I, I don't know if I have problems. No? Yeah, I, I'm not. Can you hear me? If you can, just thumbs up. Yes, yes, I can. So it's my problem. No. I'm going to sign out and sign in again. Okay. Um, no, I think it's her problem because I can because hear Nicola very well, so... Yes. Yeah, I think that it's Nicola's problems with connection. But I can hear Nicola pretty well. No, no, it, probably it's my English pronunciation that the creator <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I think it's Professor Ravelli's problem because I can, I, I could hear Nicola very well while her voice was kind of metallic and computerish. So. And you're speaking from Barcelona, Nicola. See, see, see. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I can see that from your window. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so distinctive. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. What part of Barcelona are you in? Uh, Urquinaona. It's uh, near. Uh, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My son lived in Barcelona yeah. for years, and that's yeah. one of the key areas. Mm. Yes. Okay, I'm yes. back. Oh, sorry. Good. Perfect. <laughs> Uh, some of you froze and some of you didn't, so I wasn't sure if it was my connection or yours, so I've disappeared and come back again. Sorry about that. All right, thank you, Nicola. I think we'll stop there if that's okay. Um, yes. But generally, yes, so we can see a relationship between the features of some of the features of the building and some of the values that it attributes. And in the Leipzig one, that that a uh, sense of transparency, very interesting, relates also to some of the observations of the first group. And um, like just imagine a university today building one of their great new buildings, which most universities seem very busy doing, without a big glass component. Right? It's just not not the norm for now right yeah so uh the, that sense of engagement with the outside the permeability of the border is is generally fairly important okay and the stadium yes the catalan language as well as the content of the language very important for the values and the uh spatial location in the city as you said opposite the like mm, pahola opposite to the spanish one very interesting I think that um, merits um, a little, that merits more attention. That's really very interesting. Okay, um, and Michael, just super quickly, um, yes. I'm able to speak to yours, but only just a minute. Yes, right. only a minute. Essentially, it, uh, the Mosaic, the modern art museum in Bolzano, has similar characteristics as the Augustinum. It's a um, the message of, of modernism, of progress, of transparency and, and permeability uh, transported through um, uh, high glass ceilings, uh, glass facades, and, and the con architectural contrast between the mosaic and its surroundings. But the interesting thing about the mosaic is also its uh, contradictions because for example, uh, in the beginning, there was an open free Wi-Fi access and then uh, it was removed because there were too many non-white people 
uh, dwelling in its surroundings and and complaints and so on so so this message of permeability has been um compromised during the years and and you can see it also and in, in how the space is used and and another interesting thing about the museum it's a uh, 200 meters um, nearby the Bolzano prison which is uh, a complete opposite of of the museum so you can see these both uh, buildings with our complete opposite messages, um, but um, interesting uh, connections. Yes. Mm, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Very interesting. So a couple of those points are very important. The, uh, a lot of these new iconic buildings contrast greatly with their surroundings. Yeah. So this was something that many of you picked up on. So that is an example of one resource having meaning across different metafunctions. So the resource there is the style or modality of the building. So it has a impact on interactional meaning in terms of modality, like how real we see it as being, you know, is it a normal building or a groovy building, you know, a weird building, something like that. But also it has an impact on organizational meaning in terms of framing. So we recognize this building as being distinct because of the strong contrast with its surroundings. Yeah, and um, that notion of contradictions obviously related to the time and the context, um, probably a lot of um, maybe refugees in the environment uh, who don't have access to internet resources themselves and so on, I'm, I'm guessing. Um, but yes, the presence of contradictions is always interesting to explore further. Yeah, yeah. As well as the impact of um, time on the spatial design. So if you think about the design of offices uh, in um, like large corporate offices, you know, the fashion in recent years has been for the open plan workspace, you know and much interaction and so on. Is that going to be the same when people come back to their offices after COVID, if they come back, right? So I think we will see some considerable changes in things like office design, maybe even school classroom design um, following COVID, presuming we get past it. So we don't want to go down that track. Okay, so um, group four, all right. So is Anna, Ricardo, Alessia and Antonella uh, looking at, um, I think everyone's looking at a library or Antonello, maybe something else, I'm not quite sure. So the question I asked here was who or what kind of person is construed as the contemporary user of this space? Okay, so who's going to speak for group four? Hello, I'll be the one speaking. Yeah. So, well, um, yesterday we managed to meet online and we discussed a lot about our, bu our buildings and since they are pretty alike, we noticed, we identified uh, many commonalities and many analogies uh, among them. So first of all, we noticed that there could be uh, two types of groups of users. So a primary group of users composed by um, university students, uh, students in general and scholars as well. And then we have a secondary group uh, that consists primarily of um, citizens or, or tourists or visitors. So the first group um, generally go, goes there on, on purpose, like for doing research or for like in order to study or to, to have like to get updated in, in their research and in their work. And then we have like, um, yeah, we noticed that over time there has been a, a change of building purpose in, in all the buildings that we analyzed, for instance, uh, the Aldo Moro campus uh, uh, once was a, a deserted place, uh, then a parking area, and nowadays it's a, a university building. Then we have the civic library Marangelli, once uh, a part of San Giuseppe's uh, abbey, and nowadays a, a library. Uh, then we have the library at San Giorgio in Poggiale. Once uh, it was a, a church built in the 16th century and currently is a library. And then we have uh, like uh, the place that I 
that I chose, which is um, the library of the Archigymnasio. It was the seat of the uh, university uh, in Bologna in the 16th century. And now it's this wonderful library, uh, very uh, with a lot of exquisite frescoes and sculptures and, and statues. And it's really wonderful because all of the buildings have these coexisting elements uh, between past and, and present. So they are very um, iconic, very symbolic for the city because we have this um, past present permeation and uh, well, the combination between ancient and modern uh, kind of stands out quite a bit in, in all of these uh, buildings. And uh, what then we have uh, as well noticed that all of the buildings, um, all the buildings like develop vertically uh, through ladders or, or stairs, and they are either in the city center or uh, near the city center. So they are, it's very convenient to, to get there with uh, means of transport or uh, simply on foot. And mm -hmm. what next? Uh, um, yes, we noticed that they are multi-purpose spaces. So of course they are um, libraries and, and areas of knowledge and culture, but then people after having uh, studied or, or researched, they generally hang around there or meet up in order to drink coffee or to grab something to eat. And there is this permeation between uh, culture, knowledge and entertainment, which uh, we, we found it very, uh, very important to, to point out actually. Mm. And wow. yes, I think that's pretty much it. Okay, great. Yeah, love that. Thank you. Um, yes, can I ask about um, your text, Ricardo? Um, when people are using that as a library, they're going in and sitting at the desk, you know, and reading and just studying. Is that correct? Yeah, but before doing that, they have to pass through a, a metal detector because the library is very ancient, so you're not supposed to bring too much stuff in it, and you have to be very... Uh, there's this metal detector uh, checking that you don't bring yeah, in some yeah. dangerous material. Um, yes, that, but if we contrast that to the civic library at Marangela, um, that's a space where it's comfortable to sit and chat and, you know, yeah. So, yeah, they're a little bit different in that regard. Yeah, but I think I think you pick up a couple of very interesting things there. The notion of primary and secondary users um, is not a distinction that uh, Robert McMurtry and I have made in our analysis, but I think that's extremely useful. Of course, it's there implicitly, but um, that notion is very useful. And um, uh, so whoever was looking at the baptistry, uh, Marta, that came up in your work as well, of primary and secondary users, um, and also the multifunctionality of the space. And this, of course, relates to representational meaning. You can do different things in there you know, read your book or get a cup of coffee. But this has important implications for interpersonal meaning as well. And um, Marie Stenglen says in her work that when you have this multifunctionality, it's kind of a hybridization. So you hybridize the functions of this space. It gives people more reasons to be there and to stay there. So you don't have to leave the library to go and get coffee. You can have it in there. Yeah? And um, Robert and I have uh, looked at a library at our university which um, has bean bags, so people can have a little snooze. It has group rooms, it has individual rooms, it has open spaces and so on and so on. It doesn't actually have a cafe inside, but you can bring food and drink in, yeah. But this hybridization is also something that's very common in contemporary buildings, museums, offices, you know, so uh, rather than the specialization and differentiation of spaces, the sort of um, yeah, mixing up of different spaces and their purposes. Yeah, great. All yeah. right, thank you. All right, so group five. So we have uh, Julia, Maria Sofia, and then Rico. Uh, we are talking about um, the Palazzo Ducal in Modena and Broletto, and the Broletto in Novana, Novara. Sorry, my. My page is a bit dark, so I can't read it very well. And the question here was, um, how does the historical knowledge or absence of it change the way users might read these spaces? 
Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, for the group. <laughs> we settled that. And um, yes, there are actually two ducal palaces uh, because one is in Sassuolo, is Enrico's one, and one is in Modena, which is the one I analyzed. And we had to give kind of um, differentiated answers, like we couldn't really put them together because uh, in one side there was um, my Duca Palace, which right now is a military academy. So obviously it has a different use. And then there was uh, Enrico's Ducal Palace, which is still seen and let's say used as a Ducal Palace and it's it's an historical site, etc. While um, the Broletto is, uh, for what I've understood, it was a word used in the medieval times to describe like a, a courtyard or a place surrounded by walls. So, um, and, and Maria Sofia's uh, uh, place, which was Broletto in Novara, was actually really interesting because she uh, told us, and you can read it in the document that we shared, that uh, it's not actually a really well-known place. So like the, the people in the city might actually not know or not recognize the name because it's such a, um, it's a place with lots of, um, um, let's say, pubs or restaurants. So it's kind of difficult to for them to realize, oh, Broletto, you're talking about that place with all those meeting points where people sit and everything. And that actually has a name and it's recognized as that, right? While for the Ducal, the Ducal Palaces, obviously, uh, they're very well known because obviously you just see them, you can spot them <laughs> in plain sight. And um, uh, obviously the historical meaning, the, the, the knowledge are, beside for the Broletto, obviously, the, the, for the Ducal Palaces, it are, the, the historical knowledge are really important um, in different ways. So the Sassuolo Ducal Palace is more of a, a, a common knowledge, so everybody knows that. But for, for the Military Academy Ducal Palace here in Modena, um, it's more difficult for a civilian to know that, maybe because obviously they cannot get in very easily, as maybe in Sassuolo they would. So the cadets inside the place know very well its historical meaning, while the civilians have more of a hard time to know it because obviously they cannot get it. And um, but the cities are uh, quite, mm, let's say, uh, not Novara with Broletto again because maybe uh, they do not all civilians, not all people know about this place. But for Sassuolo and and Modena, uh, people are impacted by by these historical knowledges because obviously uh, the, the the ducal palaces are very big, are huge, and you can see them, and it's and they're in plain sight for everyone. So I think we had this like um, dichotomy between our three sites, our three texts because texts because um, they are all historical, they all have historical knowledge and meanings, but they were quite different from one from the other. And if Enrico and Maria Sofia want to say something else, I think that was more or less what we talked about, but maybe I forgot something. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, so uh, Julia, yours was the um, a palace where uh, civilians can peek in at the entrance, but you can't yes. go in. So there's a yes. gate or a guard or something like that. Yeah. Yes. And in, inside there's an open courtyard that is, is, of, is typical of these buildings, but you can't walk on it. Exactly. It's it's the weirdest thing. And I've been inside so many times for many reasons, mainly because as I wrote in my uh, individual uh, document, I, I dance historical dances. So I had the chance to walk in it, uh, which is uh, funny. Actually, in one of the pictures in the debutant ball, I am one of the girls <laughs> because I did it. <laughs> but, um, but yes, usually nobody can cross it beside the chief of the military academy because it's such a a place with historical meaning and historical knowledge that cadets too have to respect the fact that maybe they do not yet have the honor to cross it, right? So they have to go around it to, to reach one place, maybe to, to arrive from one place here to the other place on the other side, they have to go around it. And it's not actually the only place. There is a garden uh, in the back uh, part of the uh, military academy, and they cannot cross that either because it's it's really important for them. So, uh, but civilians can't uh, either. I've been inside not only for dances but for like um, presentations, also for the university because University of Modena sometimes 
uh, teams up with the academy and they present uh, projects inside of it. And they presented like a, a, some cars with the engineering department and something. And but but civilians still couldn't step in the courtyard. So there were militaries around saying, "You cannot step there. You cannot step there," because it's yes, it's really important for them. So yes. So. <laughs> The use of that space defines different users, you know, who's got the permission or the yeah. prestige, the status to use it. Yeah, very interesting. And even though the broletto is very different from, um, from the palaces, that contrast, particularly in borders and framing, is really interesting. So the broletto not so clearly defined, you know, but the palaces, big strong walls and... Mm -hmm. um, contrasting in their time and now in terms of yeah. architecture and the surrounding environment. So that sort of uh, two texts that contrast in type can be very useful to study because it shows you what is unique about each one. Yes, yeah. uh, a thing that I found quite um, similar between Broletto and, let's say, my Ducal Palace is that um, in front of Modena's Ducal Palace right now, there is uh, the square, I think I wrote it, and now it's only for pedestrians. So there are restaurants, there are ice cream shops and everything. So like in Broletto, you can like eat and watch the historical place. So it's it's quite fun, the fact that we are surrounded so much by history and sometimes we forget it, but then you turn around and you watch the Ducal Palace, you watch the Broletto and you're like, oh, I have history around me, right? So you kind of realize that. Yeah, you do. And if you come to Australia, you realize that we don't have that particular kind of European history here <laughs> of that depth. Yeah, so when we come as tourists to Italy or another European country, we just are amazed. I'm amazed, whatever I see. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, last group, six. So Marta, Ilaria and Marina um, looking at the um, fifth, sixth century baptistry, the um, cloisters of San Pietro and the Georgian uh, Orthodox Church. And the question here was how has users movement through these spaces changed over time. Yeah, good morning. I'm going to speak for the group. So, um, so first of all, these were all um, religious places, but however, um, also their religious purpose was different from each other because in my case it was a baptistry. Uh, in the case of the cloisters, there used to be a monastery. And in the case of the church, was a church so the religious purpose uh, people used to go there was different and also um, um, in the case of the baptistry for example the um, um, the role is still to baptize people so um, people still go there to baptize children and but it's also a museum same thing it's for the monastery because um, now it holds um, exhibitions for example the European Photography Festival has taken place there and while the church hasn't changed that much throughout history and um, we noticed that also in the way in which people uh, move inside or around the building has the buildings has changed, and um, with the, both with the changing of the role of the text, uh, because in in the case of the baptistry right now people go there also for visiting it. And for example, if you go to a uh, christening, you do, do not have to pay to enter it. While if you go there to visit, you have to pay a ticket. And also for the, um, the cloisters, you have to pay a ticket to enter uh, while the, the church is for free. <laughs> and um, yeah, and also in the case of the baptistry, there is a change in, we, in the movement of users because the um, at the time when the baptistry was built, the town was lower, the level of the town was lower. And after a war and um, that we lost, <laughs> the winners decided to uh, change the river course. So we have like a Roman um, bridge without water under it because <laughs> the, the river is not there anymore. 
and uh, now you have so you have to go downstairs to get to the entrance of the um, of the baptistry while once uh, people just walked to enter it so this is one another change that we noticed and yeah that's that Basically, it. I don't know if the others want to add something. Ah, oh, I forgot the about the Orthodox Church. Uh, right now, there is. Um, Marina said that um, there is a peculiar movement people do, uh, particularly in during Easter, because they do a procession where people encycle the the church three times with candles at midnight and mm. yeah it's a particular event of course so it doesn't happen every day but still uh, it's something that uh, she brought up <laughs> and yeah that's, that's it. great thank you thank you so in those in those um three texts that notion of primary and secondary user is quite useful yeah uh, uh, thinking about the baptistry, you know, so if you <coughs> go in for a christening, you will engage with the font because that's a circular building. Mm -hmm. Engage with the font in the middle. Yeah. But if you're a tourist, the visitor, you'll just stay around the edges. Yeah, okay. you can you walk around it, both because um, also because <coughs> there are all the recesses on the sides. Mm -hmm that you can so you you want to see what's inside them so yeah. <laughs> you just go around them. yeah 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 and then the other way in which movement changes is not perhaps over historical time but the time of the year or the time of the religious calendar yeah as arena so particular movements at special times she may have losing my voice <laughs> <coughs> okay all right um, so Thank that's you. great. Let me just have a drink. I always do. This always happens. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do now, well, first of all, thank you. Um, I very much picked up in your pieces that you were nearly all analysing buildings that you really liked, yeah, or that meant something to you. And this is why I find spatial discourse analysis interesting is because we live and work and hopefully travel in many places and uh, engage in entertainment. And it's always nearly always in buildings, right, um, unless we are out in nature and um, they're a central part of our lives. And I think the way that they communicate to us and the way we can communicate with buildings is quite interesting. And it's a very um, metaphorical and broad sense of communication you know it's a long way from studying language but hopefully you'll find it relevant to a broader contextual understanding of the environment around you um, and it was great to see your enthusiasm in those pieces so um, I just want to pick up a few particular points about doing this kind of spatial discourse analysis which is general to um, to, to you all. So I'm going to share my screen now, hopefully. Let's go back to beginning. Okay. And just tidy things up a bit. Okay. Hopefully you can see that. Um, uh, can you still see me? If I uh, do, you see me at the same time. Just give me a nod if you do. Yeah, nod yes. Your yes, we can. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, um, as I said in in my lecture a year ago, which you may or may not remember, um, in this doing this kind of analysis. The first task is just to describe, as you have all done, and it's a very simple step, but extremely important. And you have to assume that readers can't see or have not been to that place as you have been. And so we describe it for them in general and non-technical terms, just introducing the text to them. 
But the really important thing is to, um, to analyze and to analyze in a technical way, yeah? So um, each meta function in turn, with all the analyses being based on um, explicit observable features of the text and related to specific systems within each meta function. So we can um, all say that a particular building is tall, but what we want to get to is that height on the vertical plane gives an information value of ideal versus real in terms of organizational meanings. Now it might seem I'm doing that just to throw in a lot of technical terms, right? But the point is, as um, participants in, in culture, members of a culture, we can read these texts anyway, right? So we go into a space, we know it's impressive or welcoming or um, uh, inclusive uh, or exclusive and so on, okay? So we don't need an analytical framework to analyze these spaces, but if we are able to analyze them, then we can make these features explicit. And that's where we get to a deeper understanding of these kinds of texts through explicit analysis. So if you are interested in pursuing this further, then I really encourage you to take on the technical details of the approach, yeah? Okay. And so we want to move from those observations to analysis. So, for example, um, we might interpret a particular space. I'm not referring to a specific one here, but let's say we've got a building and we say, oh, it's open to everyone. That's something we feel. That's something we know because we are users. So how is that achieved? All right. Perhaps it's through representational means that the participants are anyone in the town who can use that space. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the Ducal Palace for the Military Academy, we just found out, is not open to everyone, yeah? So not everyone can walk across the square, not everyone can go into the building, yeah? But it's open to everyone might be achieved in interactional terms. So if there's no gate or barrier, the institution does not exert control over the users. So interactionally, it's open, yeah? or it might be organizationally. So for example, uh, framing between the space and the rest of the town may be weak, you know, so transparent borders or no borders. So it might just be defined by the presence of a, a roof and a change in flooring, for example, but with open walls. So that suggests a permeable barrier. So our interpretation, like the endpoint in a way, it's open to everyone, kind of it needs to be anchored in analysis and in analysis of one or more of the meta functions. Right, another point to um, emphasize is that very often one resource has uh, multiple roles to play in terms of the meta functions. And this is true of language as well, yeah? So um, a resource um, such as contrast, you know, a um, uh, contrast of design of one building with all of its surroundings has got implications for modality, which is an aspect of interactional meaning. So the style is different. So um, buildings that all look like each other, we can, whatever that style is, we consider to be norm, the norm or normal for the time. But the building that is out of place contrasts in style, it's different, it's unusual and so on. So um, as well as having implications for modality, it also has implications for framing in terms of organizational meaning. So even though there may not be a physical barrier between the buildings, the contrast in styles creates a frame and separates one building from another. So many of these resources turn up across the different meta functions. So that's just something to look out for in your analyses. Um, particularly when you get down to a more delicate or more detailed level of analysis, it's important to differentiate the different systems. So sometimes it can be hard to see what the difference is. So maybe power and social distance look like they're more or less the same thing, but in fact, they're separate variables and they can be differentiated. So in terms of spatial design, power is, um, uh, is realized by height on the vertical plane, whether people are on the same level 
or uh, one personal thing is above or below another. Yeah, so power is is a variable which is materialized by the vertical plane. Yeah, social distance is is interconnected with power, um, but it's different. Okay, so social distance is about um, proximity on the horizontal plane, how close we can get to someone else. And of course, we all know what social distance is now um, uh, because of COVID. And related to that point, um, differentiating systems, we also need to differentiate the general meanings of words like power with their specific and technical use. So um, power could be a general way of interpreting buildings. And we say this building is very powerful, or maybe we could use immersion like that, you know, we get a strong sense of immersion in this building and so on. But in the model, we don't have immersion as a technical term, but we do have power as a technical term. And it's just that relationship on the vertical axis. Okay, power can also be realized by some other variables such as um, chthonicity, which is spelt correctly, that solidity on the base plane, or particular elements of materiality. So if you're using materials that are very, very expensive or very rare, that may indicate uh, attribute power to the institution because of that. Um, so it's important because many of the terms do have uh, everyday meanings. It's important to be aware of when you are using a term with an everyday sense or a technical sense. Something also so very important to consider is alternative readings of the same space. So most of you liked your buildings and had a positive responses to them. Think, and if that's the case, think about someone who might have a negative response to that building for some reason, a resistant reading. Yeah. So a quiet library might be um, the best place in the world for uh, many people, particularly if you want to get on with your studies. Yeah. But for others, it might be uncomfortable. So think about the values you are attributing to the resources and how they might be read differently by um, other people. Yeah. And of course, in all of the systems, there's lots of um, tricky bits of analysis. So I think a lot of people struggle to engage with the process types in terms of representational meaning. So we can get to a level of analysis about the symbolic meanings and so on, but the details of the particular process types um, were generally, well, generally they weren't detailed. So try and get down to ideas identifying the um, uh, whether the process types are um, in particular narrative or conceptual. And you do have to keep in mind here what it is you're analyzing at that particular point. So if we're looking at the exterior of a building, you know, we might see elements of it. Um, and it may have been uh, the art museum the Modern Art Museum or the Leipzig University building, one of these, from the exterior, it looks um, both narrative and conceptual. There's some sense of movement, but also some sense of solid solidity. So the system network by its nature does suggest that this is an either or choice. Yeah, but I think we can uh, reread these spaces um, for two things at the same time. Yeah, and without going into all the details of the system here, you can see that there are more details. So that's a level that you can go to in your analyses if you um, pursue this further. In interactional meaning, I think involvement was something that was um, tricky for a lot of people. So involvement is about the approach either to a building like to the front door um, or um, or the approach to um, an interior space or an object within, it, within an interior space. So let's say you're approaching um, uh, the main trophy in the Chelsea Football Club room of trophies, for example. So the question is, do you approach uh, the building, the space or the object frontally, directly, which gives you more involvement, or obliquely, which gives you less involvement? So if your pathway to the front of the building is oblique and maybe it's a curved pathway or a jagged pathway, it's less involving. Now, 
Um, McMurtry and I uh, interpret this a little bit differently from Chris and von Lewin in relation to images. So for them, the oblique involvement in an image represents detachment. So you view something from the side, so you're a little bit attached and the frontal is involved because you're involved. And, and we agree with that, but we find that the frontal involvement is likely to be more confronting. Yeah, you have to be a little bit more sure of yourself to go straight through the front door. Yeah, if, you're, if the user is in some way lacking confidence or feels they don't belong to that space or don't have the right of entry, an oblique pathway will be more comfortable for that, for that person. Yeah, so frontal and oblique is about the approach to the building or something within it. And this is to do with interactional meaning, you know, how the user is positioned in relation to the space. Uh, in organizational meaning, um, information values is something that's a little bit tricky, but very, very interesting to pursue. And here we do need to uh, be careful different ways of looking at it. So again, we might look at the exterior of a building and particularly those buildings with height, we will nearly always see a differentiation between the ideal and the real. So what's up in the ideal? In the church, it's the cross at the top of the church, whereas it's the door at the entry level in the space of the real for people to enter, yeah? So if we're looking at it as if it's two dimensional, particularly from the outside, we can see those kinds of values. So ideal and real and probably polarization on the left and right as well, potentially. When you're thinking about the interior of the building or perhaps also the placement of a building within a larger context like a city, you want to think about the aerial view. Yeah, so it might be uh, you might create a little uh, sketch map of the interior, but from above or take a, a view from above. Yeah, so um, there it's unlikely to be ideal and real that's in place because we're looking down on it. Right. And we, we still want to consider the building, but it's likely to be values perhaps of center and margin. So a lot of those very traditional buildings in Italy have got that strong structure around a courtyard, you know, so what is it that is in the center, you know, and sometimes it's an empty center, but also very symbolic. Um, the art installation at Harvard University was particularly interesting in using an, a generally empty space to be the location for a very important art exhibition. So that placement in um, informational value terms immediately gave that installation very um, strong symbolic values. Yeah? And if we think of information values uh, back on the horizontal plane and moving through a building, we often have a differentiation of uh, before and after, before you enter the building and after when you are in. So when you're outside the church versus inside, when you're outside the university or the library versus inside and so on, what is the meaning of that transition? You know, it's about acquiring knowledge or um, engaging in a religious act and so on. So all of the information values um, can be pursued in more detail and um, think about which perspective you are looking at things from. Okay, so I'm going to do, uh, I have a couple of questions for you and we'll go back to the open screen. So um, I want to leave the last few minutes for your, your general questions, if you have any. And then perhaps you may have a response to my questions. What did spatial discourse analysis really reveal or perhaps open up for you in relation to your text? And do you feel that there are extensions that are needed to the model or changes that are needed to the model? Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing there, go back to everyone on Zoom. So, um, yeah, so um, first of all, for you, any general questions that you have, which may be going back to a specific detail of analysis and so on. Okay, so I've got a question in the chat. Um, so Federico, do you think that due to the effects of COVID-19 on our social lives, the metafunction of interactional meaning should be rethought in terms of how to make an analysis at that level, perhaps considering that physical contact and freedom of movement is still restricted. We hope not for long. Mm, very interesting. Um, I, 
I don't think it needs to be rethought, yeah. I think the um, dimensions of analysis are highly applicable to the COVID context. So what we need to do is contrast the pre-COVID and during COVID situations, yeah. So um, interactional meaning, you know, social distance, okay. So um, uh, what, so the, the distances of, um, public versus social versus intimate don't change, but our responses to them perhaps change, right? So we might feel really uncomfortable with an intimate social distance now, yeah? Also, we might find a different interrelation between interactional meaning and organizational meaning. So we now have um, close social distances that are marked with frames like a perspex frame in a shop to separate the customer um, from the shopkeeper, even if the actual distance is the same. Yeah, so we get framing used in a different way now because of COVID. So I think the resources are there to do the analysis, but the point is to contrast the current situation with our previous normal situations. Yeah, and I think that would be a very interesting thing to do, um, uh, both in everyday social situations and also uh, places of work and education and other professions. Yeah, thank you. Great question. Thank you. So, any other questions? Like, how should I analyze? I may no? have one. Martha, yes. yes, because uh, while I was analyzing the baptistry, uh, especially um, regarding the interactional meaning with the institutions, at some point I was thinking that I was kind of describing, um, I mean, it seemed to me that I was writing a history of art uh, text, not a discourse analysis text, because um, for example, I noticed the distribution of light that was higher in the higher part of the building while the lower it's kind of dark and I thought it could symbolize God easily <laughs> and I, I thought okay this, is, this could be an interaction with the religious institutions institution but I thought okay it's also probably the meaning they wanted to achieve when they built the, the place. And I thought it was kind of weird. Is I mean, yeah. I didn't know what, what I was doing at some point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, that's fair enough. Um, I think the, the, the difference then is to put in the technical details of the analysis, yeah? Okay. So it, what's important in that particular text is that the light is coming in from up high. Well, first of all, it's coming in, right? Yeah. And second, <laughs> second it's up high, yeah? And then... And then that shows us in organizational meaning, there's a differentiation of above and below. Yeah. And so um, uh, this relates to the sense of the ideal and the real. And of course, what's in the ideal is, is God and the heavens and what's in the real is the people on earth. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, this, this relates to the analysis of images as well. You know, you can go and analyze a photograph, a painting, an art installation and so on. And yes, you can do an uh, art historical description and analysis, okay. But a social semiotic uh, analysis is, is explicit about the materialization, the realization of the features which enable you to arrive at an interpretation. And that's often implicit in these other approaches. Yeah, not that they are not valuable. You know, art history teaches us a lot, but often the interpretation is not always, um, the reasons for the interpretation is not always made explicit. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so Antonella, are there resources in the frame to analyze spaces from an environmentally friendly point of view? Would it be useful? Oh, sorry, everybody's dogs are getting tired. That's my dog. Sorry, can't really Sorry. Um, excuse me. Okay. 
Don't you love Zoom? Okay. Uh, can are there, sorry, hopefully you'll stop there. Are there resources to analyze spaces from an environmentally friendly point of view? Would it be useful to include them? Awareness of climate change, social responsibility. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I think particularly in terms of representational meaning. Yeah, so the materials that are used, very important. Um, some of the hidden aspects, so the energy that is consumed in the building. Um, so this is where we particularly see environmentally friendly uh, features. Social responsibility. Yeah, like modern corporations pay a lot of attention to social responsibility in the design of buildings, both in terms of energy consumption and resources, but also a healthy environment for um, the users of those spaces, uh, healthy for their physical health and their mental health and so on. So um, I think the resources are there in the framework to account for that. And that's a particularly important thing to account for. It would be very interesting to see in uh, interactional terms if there's other manifestations of environmentally friendly factors in that way. So for example, um, related to senses of openness and what the user can and can't do. But I'd have to think about that one a little bit more. Yeah. Okay. A couple of hands up. Um, sometimes your your boxes move around the screen all by themselves, so then I lose track. So I'm going to go to uh, Giorgio first. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And and apologies because I didn't do my homework here. I was pressed with extra school assignments. I'm very sorry. Uh, but I had I, I had uh, two two impressions here. Uh, uh, First of all, uh, is that the, this notion of uh, first and, uh, and secondary use, primary and secondary user is key. I was thinking when, um, when um, the presentation on the Barcelona Stadium was there, I was thinking about it a lot before you, other people mentioned it, because it is a stadium, but it also acts as a museum. So uh, you go there and you see this, this multifunctional, multipurpose uh, structure, blah, blah, blah. But my question is, uh, what is exactly the space in multimodal analysis for uh, uh, strongly oppositional readings? I was thinking of this of those uh, strategies and tactics uh, and especially I was, I, well, well people, because several people were, were talking about either churches or the Ducal Palace and so on. And I was thinking about two places, one in Bologna, one in Brussels, uh, and their church places, right? Uh, it's Piazza San Francesco in Bologna and Place Flaget in Brussels. And those are places where people go and sit uh, late at night and, and you drink with people and, and you listen to music from like, boombox etc so they became social places in a way that is completely opposite to the intention of uh, those who made that space right uh, and this whole idea of well the, the, the history of the place uh, the all the tradition that, that is there is somehow completely overlooked by a totally new approach by the reader um, so my point is uh, uh, is is it is it multimodal analysis rather than a more architectural oriented approach more um, top down or is there uh, enough space for those bottom up oppositional approaches approaches to those spaces thank you yeah yeah no that's a very good point Giorgio so we are talking here mostly about like the architecture yeah but um, uh, the built environment is not just the buildings, it's also the users and how they use it, yeah? So how the space is used is part of the meaning. So if you have um, uh, a grassy area with no chairs, people can still sit there, yeah? So you do have to look, and it's very important to look at what people do in the space, what they are allowed to do, and also what they're not allowed to do. So there may be signs in a room which say no eating or drinking, but people are eating and drinking. So um, yeah, so very important to look at that. Yeah, so that that is got that has got to be part of the analysis. So the role of the user in there, uh, Robert McMurtry's work has particularly tried to push that forward a little bit. Um, the other sense of oppositional reading is is in the value of uh, a particular function and so on. So 
there's a difference between observing what's going on and judging what's going on. So the grassy space where you're not supposed to sit and people sit there. I think the role of the analyst is to say that people sit there. Um, it's not the role of the analyst to say that that is the right thing or the wrong thing. But you can say it's the right thing from, from this point of view and the wrong thing from that point of view. I think that's very, that's probably an important factor to consider. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. Um, Michael, oh, your question. So you've written it down. So um, the concept of provenance in multimodal discourse analysis definitely applicable to buildings. I'm thinking of reconstructed buildings in Eastern Germany, yes. Yes, so provenance um, coming from the work of Christian von Leeuwen, yes, is very important in interpretation. It's like bringing history with you, yeah? So this is particularly in relation to representational meanings, um, the connotations in a way of buildings and so on. So if it's a, a classical stone structure, you're going to have certain expectations perhaps about what you can and can't do there. So yes, that's a very important idea to bring in, um, particularly in relation to representational meanings. Yep. Okay, uh, Delfina. Hi. Um, I, I wanted to jump off of what uh, Giorgio said, because my question slash suggestion for uh, expanding the analysis uh, would be also kind of this uh, posing the question to the analyst of what are valid slash legitimate slash official ways of interacting and which ones are invalid or illegitimate, right? Because as Sergio was saying, and also as I, I mentioned in my worksheet, there are sometimes these things are kind of blurry. Uh, but people might interact in unofficial ways uh, and leave their mark in unofficial ways. And I think that it's very interesting. And also, um, perhaps one of the things that I think would be most interesting to, to also do in this kind of analysis, which has been great, by the way, because it made me think a lot uh, in a more structured way, uh, allowing me to understand how the same thing can have multiple uh, implications, is... Um, who is it designed for in terms maybe from more of a you know personas design perspective but then with sub questions about who is the desired user and who is the undesired user because many spaces do have you know political uh, implications about who is the undesired user and these can be done in, in very implicit ways so one example i was thinking of was the british museum I would say that an undesired user might be a Rapa Nui person from Easter Island who goes and sees their Moai there and who is a victim of colonialism and that might cause uh, a problem when if they try to say something, right? Uh, and, and, and this I'm saying from experience because I've been to Easter Island and I know these people <laughs> uh, and you know there is a, a lot of hate towards the British Museum. So who is being thought of in when this space is designed, right? I think thinking of who might be desired or undesired there might be interesting. And another thing, sorry, last thing, another example would be like, if there's sorry, facial no. recognition. You, you have to stop there because it's already very complex. <laughs> okay, let's stop there. So um, uh, yeah, desired and undesired, you know, uh, yeah. So I think we don't, <sighs> I think intentionality in these kinds of spaces is, is somewhat useful to consider, yeah? So the big glass facade, you know, we, we want to maybe envisage that, that was to create transparency, you know. Um, but you don't want to get too caught up in terms of intentions. I think what's more useful to look at is use, okay? Use as uh, designated by the institution or the owner, you know, so like as owners of homes or our own space, we decide who comes in, who goes out. You know, institutions do this as well. Um, in relation to the art museum, I think earlier they said that they didn't want, they started with this open policy, Wi-Fi for everyone, but then it brought undesirable. So they soon changed their policies. So um, use 
and social practice is really important. Um, so an institution is not just the walls of the building, it's its actual practices that it engages in, keeping people in, keeping people out, which defines um, whether they're desirable or not, um, and how they relate to them once within the space defines whether they're desirable or not. So a lot of museums are trying very hard to um, reconstruct and retell those colonial stories, you know, uh, some returning objects to their owners um, and some not, some doing it in different ways. So I think it's important to come back to social practices, both by the users and the institution that owns the building. Yeah. All right. So one super quick last question, Daniel, if you can make your question very fast. Yes. Do you mean me? Yes. Daniel yeah. Pasqua. So um, it's kind of related to the things that you were talking about, but um, it was very difficult for me sometimes to um, decide what was just my judgment, which is very subjective and very biased, and how we can actually make the analysis and the implications kind of uh, general for everyone. So have you ever tried to, uh, for example, collect pieces of evidence from different um, kind of analysts between inverted commas so that perhaps you can find patterns that are recurrent and you can say color is clearly indicating that from my interactional meaning, this is clearly so. Or how, how does it work to make um, kind of um, mm -hmm. the analysis more objective and probably replicable? Yes, okay, so we don't do anything like uh, intercoder uh, radar reliability, okay. But the way to make it objective and replicable is to be specific about the resources that you're talking about. So if you just say the building is very powerful, no one can um, uh, engage with that. But if you talk about a specific resource of height on the vertical plane or the, the, the actual placement, um, people can at least refer to that physical resource and they might disagree with your interpretation, yeah, which is fine, but, but it needs to be on the basis of the same resource. They need to say, well, for these reasons, I think it means something else. So I th don't think we necessarily have to arrive at exactly the same interpretation, yeah, but whatever interpretation we do have has to be based on an explicit and a technicalized analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And another another strategy you can have also is to take a little bit more of an ethnographic or a textographic approach, talking to the architects, the owners of the building, the users of the spaces, because that can reveal some interesting responses. Yes, because actually, well. I didn't say, but I was thinking of this kind of double purpose. So, of course, on the one hand, you can take advantage of having um, analysts, but this may not be the purpose. But on the other hand, of course, we are analyzing. Um, we are doing the spatial discourse analysis based on our social practices, beliefs, and attitudes. So I guess we are greatly influenced by them, and, and any other researcher may apply different rules and categories and attributes. So yes, this is why you need to allow for reading positions. So as Delphine has said, you know, someone from the Easter Islands is going to interpret uh, the Mui very differently from a, a, a British person. Yeah. Now my dog is demanding attention. So. Um, <laughs> Before you go, I want everyone to smile and wave and I'm going to screenshot you all for permanent record. Yeah, smile, wave. Yay, beautiful. And thank, thank you very everyone much. for engaging. Thank and, you. Um, enjoy, thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day and uh, have a look at my at small comments on your work. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. You. Thank, you. thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Back in it <laughs> for those of us to go on. Okay, we reconvene at ten forty-five. Thank you.